Good afternoon and welcome to our monthly Ask the Expert series, um, which is sponsored through the Colorado Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. Just a couple of housekeeping tasks before we get started. First of all, I'm Kathy Bodine, and I direct the innovation ecosystem for the CCTSI here, uh, located at the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. We are delighted to have you today. Um, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there's an opportunity for you to, to ask a Q&A, which I will have open during our our talk today. So if you have a question or um, a comment that you'd like me to uh, share with Chelsea, please do so and I'll be happy to uh, get that on. Um, and the record the uh, Ask the Expert series will be recorded again today and it will be hosted as a podcast very soon so you'll be able to have that. So Let's get started. I am really excited to welcome Dr. Chelsea Megan today. Uh, I I pinged her and begged her to join us because I think Chelsea has some really exciting um, information and, and she's had a lot of experiences that I think are gonna be very useful for us today. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She's an assistant professor in the departments of bioengineering, pediatrics, and the school of medicine. And she's the principal investigator of the Bioinspired Pulmonary Engineering Lab at the University of Colorado, Denver, Anschutz. And her research is focused on using innovative biomaterials and bioengineering approaches, such as 3D printing, to build in vitro models of lung disease and repair. So I find that really interesting. She has a recipient of an NSF Career Award, the American Thoracic Society Recognition of Early Academic Achievement Award, and the University of Florida's 40 Gators Under 40 Alumni Award. She teaches regulatory affairs, so bear in mind if you have questions, and research methods, and was recognized as the Colorado Bioscience Association's Educator of the Year. Here's where it gets a little interesting. Before she came to academia, she served as the Director of Product Development for Sharklet Technologies, where she led a research and development team that designed medical devices, um, she previously uh, completed, ugh, I can't talk today, completed an NIH postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Colorado Boulder in the ANSETH Research Group, where she developed user-controlled, dynamically turnable biomaterials. She earned her PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Florida, and her doctoral research focused on using new materials and surface topographies to control adhesion of marine fouling organisms and mammalian cells. Okay, so that's a lot for someone that um, is so young. And I'm excited because what I like about Chelsea is she, you know, unlike many of us, she didn't start as an academic and go to industry. She started in industry after finishing her academic um, education. So it's gonna be a fun conversation for today. And I have a ton of questions for Chelsea. So I'm gonna get started with, with the big one. So Chelsea, tell us your story. How did your path lead you to becoming interested in industry and then an academic? Well, Kathy, thank you so much for having me today and thank you for the, the excellent introduction. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I like to preface my story by telling everyone that we always talk a lot about work-life balance and we say these things separately, but um, I believe that work is a big part of our lives and sometimes our personal lives influence our career decisions and sometimes our careers influence our personal lives. So um, I started out with a degree in material science and engineering and I was a first generation college student. I didn't know I was a first generation college student. I didn't know what that was. I'd never heard of it before. I didn't understand that there were special challenges that I was facing that maybe other students didn't face because their parents knew everything about going to college. Um, and so when I, it, was, it came time to go to graduate school, I applied to some different grad schools, but I didn't have much advice on where to go or how to do this the right way. Um, so I ended up staying at the University of Florida, which is not typical for someone who's interested in an academic career. They usually switch schools in between. Um, <clears throat> but I stayed there because number one, I was gonna get a fellowship, so I knew I would be funded. It's very important for graduate students. Um, number two, I was very comfortable in Gainesville. I knew how to get to school and how to do all the things I needed to do. Um, and then third, I think that this is a good question for all graduate students to ask when they're interviewing. I asked, who has funding in the department and how long does it take for them to graduate students? And so a few people came to the top of that list and I ended up working with uh, Dr. Anthony Brennan, who is still an incredible mentor to me today. 
So in his laboratory, they were focused on studying marine antifouling. So Tony was sitting in a meeting once in Hawaii and he saw a submarine covered with algae and they were trying to figure out how to keep that from happening. So he asked a bunch of biologists, well, why doesn't stuff stick to sharks? And they told him, Tony, it's because they swim fast. And he was like, I don't know. So uh, his background was in dental biomaterials. So he sent out a bunch of students on a boat with dental impression material. They caught a shark, stuck it to the side, let the shark go and took this back and looked at it under a microscope. They saw that shark skin has a topography on it that helps keep marine fouling organisms. So algae, barnacles, bacteria, the things that stick to ships and whales from sticking to sharks. So this started um, their whole line of investigation where they created microtopographies in a variety of different materials that mimic shark skin. And they found that human pathogens also don't colonize those surfaces. So things that infect us in a hospital like Staph aureus, E. coli, those were not infecting these materials. And um, they spun out the company that I eventually worked for called Sharklet Technologies. So back to my story, um, after I finished my PhD, I really wanted to be in biomedical engineering and I thought I really wanted to be a faculty member. So I, I worked really hard to get a postdoc in a very famous lab. And I was incredibly shy at the time. So I was at a conference. This is my student advice is to go network. Um, and my very good friend who was not as shy as I was introduced me to Christy Anseth. And so she's in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and I moved out to Colorado and started working in her lab. I loved the experience of working in Christie's lab. It was completely different from what I used to do. Uh, I learned how to make my own polymers that were responsive to light. And I learned a whole lot um, about growing and evaluating mammalian cell responses uh, to these different surfaces. I went through my first round of faculty interviews pretty early in the postdoc process, one and a half years in. And I got really incredible interviews. I interviewed at Carnegie Mellon but I didn't get a job that year. And part of me um, just started to feel like I wasn't quite confident enough. Uh, maybe I wasn't crack, you know, meant to be a faculty member someday. And so this is where some of my personal life came into my, my faculty career decisions. And I decided, you know what? I know a lot about Sharklet. I pretty much have a PhD in what this company does. Um, I'm going to go work in industry for a while. I know that I'll get to live in Colorado, which I really enjoy. And um, and learn these new things and get this new experience. So I spent about four years at Sharklet and we were in the startup phase of this company. So we were doing things like writing NIH SBIR grants uh, to fund our research. We were still doing benchtop research. Um, and so there were a lot of aspects that were similar to academia. We still published papers, but there were a lot of aspects that were brand new to me and much more industry focused. So for example, three years after, sorry, three months after I started my job, my boss quit and his team started reporting to me. So I immediately learned how to manage people, how to manage budgets, how to manage projects, how to interact with our collaborators, which included academic folks, um, medical doctors, and other companies in industry. And I think that that experience really helped me to be successful when I started my own lab. So after a few years, I realized the things I really loved doing at Sharklet, writing those grants, leading those research projects, inventing new technologies, were actually things that are done better in academia. Um, Sharklet started to grow. They, they started doing all the regulatory paperwork that I teach students about nowadays. And that was just not interesting to me. <laughs> I'm much more excited about inventing new, new products than I am about doing the documentation that's required to get them into the clinic. So um, I started applying for faculty jobs again. And I wanna say it, it took me two or three rounds before I finally got a position. So don't give up. This faculty search process is sometimes not transparent. You don't know exactly what they're looking for. And it might be that you're very well qualified, but they want something specific that you don't know about. So keep trying. Um, anyway, I ended up here in the School of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Sciences and Critical Care Research. They wanted an engineer to help build uh, models of lung disease, and I signed right up. And so now my lab, it has moved to the Department of Bioengineering, but we uh, still collaborate very closely with medicine and um, building biomaterials that replicate the lungs has been an incredible niche field for us to be in. It's up and coming and we're really excited about the work. Awesome, thank you so much. That's really interesting. Um, 
one of the things, you know, that we're really trying to do here is to build an entrepreneurial culture to really impact patient health outcomes uh, through our work and not to just leave something in the lab. So if you're an academic and you're doing something in your lab that you think, wow, this could really help people at the end of the day, what are some necessary first steps that you would advise that academic person to think about? I think two of them are tied for first. One, talk to the physician that you think will use your device or your technology um, because they have very specific requirements for what they want, what they need, what the hospital will allow them to buy that I don't think engineers always think about. And so really having input from the beginning um, from these clinicians and these people, that the end user of your product is really important. But the other thing you should do right away is to protect your intellectual property. So write up an invention disclosure, run it through your technology transfer office. Um, here on our campus, it's U Innovations. And this is something you need to do before you disclose how to do what you do, even in an abstract presentation at a conference. It's really important to protect your intellectual property so that then you can um, spin out a company or license your technology to someone else. And I'm gonna ask you to, uh, thank you. Those are really, really good points. And I'm gonna ask you to, you know, cause a lot of times, and I've talked to tons and tons of faculty, um, and there is kind of like an irreducible tension between sharing what we've done, because that's what we're taught as researchers to do, and protecting our IP. Can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of um, why should we protect our IP and what are the rules uh, from the regulatory side on that in terms of talking about it? Sure, that's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel like in academia, you know, our currency is publications and presentations. And um, that means we have to talk a lot about what we do um, early on in order to get the word out about our, our research. And this is, like you said, at odds with how things work in industry and how things work in an entrepreneurial sense, um, where a lot of times these new inventions are kept completely secret for years and years and years as they're being developed. And then intellectual property patents are filed, right? Mm -hmm. And so my strategy in academia had to change a little bit um, because I both need, if I think something's really going to be impactful and I want to commercialize it, I both need to protect it and I need to go talk about it. And so my strategy is usually to try to keep things under wraps and not disclosed until we're about to publish our first paper. And that is, um, it's a good time to, submit your invention disclosure, I would say early, so maybe six months before your paper's ready to let CU Innovations or your tech transfer team know what you're working on uh, to pair you with a case manager and to allow you to talk to them about the process. Um, I think first and foremost, their advice should supersede all of mine <laughs> uh, because every university is a little bit different. Uh, but then in order to give you some time to really develop the technology, to learn what you're protecting and the claims in your patent, um, you know, these things have to get very specific and be very broad all at the same time to protect your intellectual property in a way um, that is unique and novel, but also to keep other people from copying what you do. So I'm, for example, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt and ask a real quick question, just in case there's somebody online who doesn't know what an invention disclosure is. What is that and how hard oh, this, is it? Yeah, this is just a form that's required by your tech transfer office and you just describe what you think is a new invention. Um, and oftentimes for, for faculty, we've already written something about it, right? You, maybe you wrote about it in a grant, maybe um, your student can help you write it, uh, you know, whoever's leading the project, a student or a postdoc. Um, it's kind of like an abstract where you describe in writing what the new idea is and why it's important, and then you provide some data. So um, that is right in line with the rest of my advice is you need to have some data defining your invention before you submit your patent. And um, so that's often why I wait until we're about to submit our first manuscript. Right. Um, typically in academia, your um, tech transfer office will encourage you to file a provisional patent first. That gives you about 12 months to come up with any additional um, data or claims that you want to add. And then you'll file a full um, patent application kind of the, the next year. Um, 
And so, yeah, as a, first you have to get that intellectual property, that patent submitted before you can really go out and tell the world how to do what you do. Mm -hmm. And why is it so important to protect these ideas? Why not give it to somebody else? <laughs> Um, I think it's important to protect these ideas so that they can be commercialized. If you don't have intellectual property, a company's not going to be interested in commercializing your technology because they won't be able to get paid for it and they won't be protected when they're commercializing it. Um, another company could come in and make the same product and sell it and be more successful. And, and so I think that's an, a side that academics, maybe we don't always hear about or don't always understand, but in order to really sell something or to have a larger company sell it for you, you need to have a patent filed and have it protected. Okay. All right, thank you. That's This is really interesting. I have a feeling we're gonna dig into all kinds of little fun things here in just a minute. So I'm very curious from your perspective because you've done both academics and industry, what do you see as the biggest difference between academics and industry? I have a funny anecdote that just happened today actually. Um, so I believe one of the biggest differences is in industry, when we plan projects and set deadlines, we really mean it. And I think that students aren't quite at that level yet when they're, when they're learning, right? So everyone in my lab goes through the process of learning how to plan a project, set deadlines, and then meet the deadlines that you set and set reasonable deadlines so that you're not you know, discouraged when you don't meet them. Um, so we wrote a paper in collaboration with an industry partner and we sent them a draft of the paper. We asked them to please return their comments within two weeks and gave them a deadline. And both of our industry collaborators had it done on time. And my student was just shocked. And I said, don't be surprised. This is how life works in industry. If you say you need something done by a certain date, people will either do that or they'll tell you they can't and pick a new date. And so I I think that's one of the things that was sort of shocking to me when I came back to academia was um, communications around deadlines and meeting deadlines was just not quite the same. It's just much more laid back. Um, other differences, I think uh, in industry, we're really looking to make a product, make it successful and make money, right? Everybody wants to make money. And so sometimes we don't dig into the question of why, you know, if this works, why does it work? How does it work? And that is something that is much more academic in, in industry minds. And so my laboratory kind of is on the edge right there. So sometimes I'll say, if it works, keep working on it and don't bother trying to figure out why it works. And that sometimes frustrates academic people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when, when you think about putting a room full of people together, half of them academics and half of them industry, how would you work to help them come together to, to seek the same path? Because I, that's where I see a lot of breakdowns when we have ideas here at the university and we go to industry, sometimes we get in the room and, and we're using different language. And how, how would you massage that situation so that um, we can be more effective? That's a great question. And I think some of that comes down to uh, thinking about our basic negotiation strategies, right? Every time that you start a negotiation, you want something positive out of the deal and so does the other side. And so I think that um, really talking to each other about what are the advantages for both sides instead of, you know, I think a lot of times in academia, we, we have this cool new thing and we wanna run up to industry and say, here's my cool new thing, pay for me to make it even better. And industry is like, well, why? Like, what am I getting out of it? And so I think that two-way conversation about how does my technology benefit your patients and how does my technology benefit your stakeholders? And, you know, how does our company learn from, you know, the years of R&D that you've put in that we haven't put in? And how does that benefit your laboratory in the end? I think those conversations, being more direct about, about that and understanding as an academic, the companies do want to help and support you, but they also need to convince their leadership that it's worth it and that it will provide a benefit to the, to the company as well. Okay, so one of the things um, that I have seen, and I think it's a, 
maybe it's culture, I don't know. But as academics, and I have, I have it too, it's, it's, I'm not picking on anyone, but in, I'm including myself, we have this tendency to think that we're here to explore, we're here to um, share our knowledge. And I've seen industry um, folk, and I won't name names, but I've seen them come to our campus and sit down with academics and ask a lot of really well-placed questions that result in them going off and making a product that was really an idea that came from one of our academics here. Um, how should a university person communicate with someone from industry and not quote, give away the farm, and yet at the same time still feel that need to have patient impact? That's a great question. I, I think some of that goes back to protecting your intellectual property up front. If you have filed a patent, uh, even if they go off and try to do the same thing you're doing, they might not legally be allowed to sell that product. Um, there are, I think that it's very helpful for you to go through your tax transfer office and to have that other level of sort of mediation and advice if you're brand new at talking to folks in industry. Um, potentially, there, there's some times where uh, confidentiality agreements will be signed. So the person in industry will, you know, promise not to go tell everybody else your awesome new idea um, and vice versa. You won't go tell everybody what they're working on. And I, and I think maybe, I guess, my best solution to that is to sort of have a mediator or a translator involved, someone at your tech transfer office, potentially that knows sort of how to speak industry and academia and can help you have those conversations in a way that don't give away all of your secrets, but still enable you to build relationships with industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen multiple times where just in what feels like casual conversation, a researcher will start sharing what they're doing, not realizing that they're sharing what could be uh, intellectual property with an industry partner. And so that's something that, um, I, I kind of watch out for when I'm in conversation. And so I'm always curious about that. Um, when you think about, because when you, what we want to do is have success, right? The end of the day, we really, really, really want to improve healthcare and, and health outcomes. So what do you see as the biggest difference? You've kind of talked a little bit in terms of um, the difference between academics and industry timelines being a big key thing and the need to make money versus the need to publish, I think, or other things. But amongst, between all of that, why do partnerships between industry and academics fail? That's a great question. Uh, part of it is timeline. I think sometimes academics don't understand how long they need to bring a product or a research idea to the point that a company would be interested in it as a product. There's a lot of um, basically due diligence that industry has to do to make sure what they're investing in is going to work. So they want to see data that, and you know, they're not any different from us. We love data too, right? Uh, they want to see data that that proves to them that this is feasible, that it, you know, it does what you say it's going to do, and it can make a big impact in patient health. And sometimes I think this is where being entrepreneurial as a young academic is difficult because I've, I've filed some patents early on in my career and our tech transfer office really wants me to push, push, push and get to the point where they can start selling my tech. And I keep saying, well, I have to get tenure first. So like I have to focus on all this other stuff. Um, and so I think one of, the big, one of the big things is timeline. You, there are milestones that companies wanna see you hit. Uh, sometimes those aren't clearly communicated or sometimes academics um, maybe don't quite understand stand um, what needs to be done to show that this could potentially be successful clinically. I think uh, along those lines, it's important to be considering a regulatory pathway as you're inventing new technologies. And this is also another area where we don't get much training as engineers. And so thinking about if this is something that could be approved or cleared by the FDA, what kind of data would be required to make that submission successful? And how to document all of those things is really important in industry. And I don't think as important in academia. There's a lot of quality control measures that happen when you do experiments in industry that, that don't happen in academia. And so I think sometimes those are barriers that lead to you know, breakdowns in these conversations where 
there's, I, we talk about a valley of death for these product ideas, right? And I think one of them is just trying to get it out the door. So in between, we're really excited about this. We filed a patent and now we've either started a company or we've licensed our technology to another larger company. There's a lot of work that has to be done to show feasibility, to properly document it and to, to really get out there and raise funds. Um, and I, I think that's a place for where academ academic and industry isn't always aligned and we're not always trained to overcome it. Yeah, I'm gonna ask a little deeper probe question here because this is always, I, I hear this from our faculty entrepreneurs. What, and I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I'm gonna ask this very well, what are the metrics that industry wants in terms of is this product viable versus the metrics that academics collect? That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> A lot of times I think academics are collecting metrics that prove that what they've made is a useful research tool. And um, oftentimes industry wants metrics that prove that this is something that is a product. And so um, that means it does what you say it's going to do. It addresses a market need. So actually doing the research of, for example, if I were selling a wound dressing, I would look into the market for wound dressings and then I would narrow that down. Does my dressing treat an acute wound that's traumatic that just happened or does it treat a, a chronic wound uh, like an ulcer, a diabetic foot ulcer? And then zoom in farther, like how does my wound dressing idea compare to these other wound dressings that are on the market? Is it this advanced wound dressing that costs $1,000 each or is it this you know, much less, is it closer to gauze? And, and we could just sell it very quickly, but it would heal better. Um, and so you have to dive in and make those comparisons to current products. You have to make an argument that there's space in the market for your product, that people would buy it and that you would make some money off of it and that the market sector you're targeting is, is large enough. Uh, that's a huge conversation and a lot of research that I, I think also can be facilitated through your tech transfer office. A lot of times there are business students that are interested in learning about these things and will help you do the market research. Um, so yeah, I believe, uh, I believe these metrics that, that sort of compare your work to a gold standard, what is actually being used clinically is really important. That's usually the question you'll get from investors. It's a question you'll get from the FDA. Uh, it's a question we don't usually think about, um, especially, I come across this all the time where people call something a control, but it's not necessarily the gold standard of what's being actually used right now. And if you don't compare to that, then we don't know if you're better, just as good or not gonna sell any products because it's not as it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so I think what I'm hearing is that that means as an academic, our language has to shift in order to get traction with industry, our language needs to shift. Is that what I'm hearing? So that we're answering the questions that industry would have, not necessarily the questions that we have at three o'clock in the morning. I think that's right. And I think I, I haven't done this yet. I haven't started my own company, but I think that you have to wear multiple hats and you have to think about what are the academic questions that will help me publish a research paper? And what are the what are the other questions that would help me create a medical product that would actually be used um, by patients? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really good um, observation. And, and what I'm curious about is how would you like literally think your way through that? Would you, I don't know, do a pro and con list? I mean, how, how would you like physically do something like that? <laughs> Well, um, I'm going to, I'll tell you from my regulatory hat, I think that if I came up with an idea that I thought was a good product, um, I would first go searching the internet to see if somebody has made a similar product. If they have, I would then go to the FDA databases, which are um, freely searchable and, and pretty easy to use. And I would see if there had been a regulatory submission on that product. Um, and then you can usually read the summaries of these regulatory submissions. So for example, if it was a 510K, which is a submission that compares your product to a product that already exists to show that it is just as safe and effective, 
um, you could read about the types of tests that they did and the standards that they used. And a lot of times these tests are um, listed out in international standards documents. So um, in engineering, we're familiar with things like ASTM or um, an ISO standard from Europe. And the FDA also provides guidelines. So they'll have guidelines on specific types of products. So I would first go try to classify my product and see if it, it has a comparable product that has shown me the regulatory pathway. And based on that, you can start to understand what type of tests that industry really wants to see and the kind of data that they would need to collect to actually have your product um, pass through the FDA. And those, those are really the kinds of things to be thinking about when you're trying to put together a data pa package that would impress an investor or someone at a company. Okay, and so I'm trying to walk my way through this and give people some, some nuggets that they can maybe utilize. And I think you're doing a great job of helping me with this. Um, so if I were gonna write a grant to take my project further, which is what we always do, um, I think what I'm hearing you say in, in this conversation is there are some things that are also equally valid. What you've just described seems equally valid to incorporate into a research project or a development project. Is that true? So kind of balancing the academic and industry a little bit? Or what That's you an excellent question. I think um, once you've started a company that the absolute best way to write a grant to fund this would be through a small business innovation research grant. SBIR and uh, the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation, lots of different organizations have these types of grants. And that will combine your academic grant writing skills with your newly found uh, FDA regulatory skills. And there were a lot of times where at Sharklet, we would write a grant where maybe the first aim focused on really doing the research. I used wound healing as an example because I worked on a wound dressing when I was there. So in the beginning, we were trying to find out, is there a pattern based on the sharklet micro pattern that helps cells migrate across the top of a wound to close it faster. So maybe aim one of that grant is to do that in a Petri dish. Which one of these works better and gets the cells across faster? Aim two could be, let's test this in an animal model and let's pick one that the FDA thinks is very close to human skin. So we picked a porcine model. And then the third aim might be, all right, let's start to run the ISO 10993 biocompatibility tests that the FDA wants to see when you turn in this data package. Or let's look at you know degradation products, or, you know whatever it is. So I think the, those grants are really an excellent strategy, but I've also seen R01 applications um, submit some of these tests that are you know standardized and well-written um, as part of what they're working on when they're working on their um, research projects. So if you aren't quite at the phase where you've started your own company, I think you can do a little bit of that, but it can't be your whole grant because all of these um, R01 type grants are really focused on hypothesis driven research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a tricky conundrum. And I think there are a lot of faculty and staff and postdocs and what have you who maybe want to see an idea go to market but they don't necessarily want to start a company. They don't want to work in industry, you know? And so trying to figure out that balance, I think. So do you have any advice for those people? Yeah, my best advice is do not be your own CEO. If you, <laughs> if, if you end up uh, spinning out a company anyway, um, you know, there are multiple exit strategies for your technology, right? You, you could license your technology to a larger company. They will take it and develop it. They will use your insights as a consultant to make sure it happens. And you won't have to be in industry per se. Um, but also, if you did start a company, you don't have to be the business side of that company. You don't have to be the CEO, the person that's going out and pitching for venture capital. You don't have to be making the business deals. You can hire a very good business person to do that. And I, I have to be honest, I think that's what I would do if I started a company. I would maintain a chief science officer or a chief technology officer type of role. And I would hire a very, very good team to support me on the business marketing and finance sides. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, thank you. That was, I think that's helpful. Um, and feel free, again, for those of you in our audience, we'll take a um, intermission here for a second. Uh, feel free to enter any questions you have for Chelsea in the Q&A, and we'll make sure she gets them. So for yourself, 
how do you determine who or what partnerships to pursue? That's, <clears throat> this is a great question. I have my funny answer, which is I like to work with anyone that I would enjoy chatting with after work over a beer. <laughs> um, I tell my students that if you would not enjoy spending time with your collaborator, you're probably not going to enjoy the collaboration because we take a lot of time um, talking through meetings. We have a lot of, you know, you have to coordinate your style so that you can write large documents together. You have to understand how each of you is going to interpret data and how, um, you know, which expertise you bring to the table. So um, ultimately, when I'm trying to put together a partnership, I ask myself, what expertise do I need that I don't have? So I'll give you an example. I'm working on a Department of Defense Expansion Awards. So this is a grant application where we're using stem cells to make models of lung tissue, and we want to study a disease called pulmonary fibrosis. So I know how to make the biomaterials that the cells go into. I chose a collaborator that I've worked with before to um, organize a conference. So I, I, I love her work style. We get along really well. We're really efficient when we work together. She's also a stem cell expert. Um, so I'll be working with her and then I'll be working with another collaborator uh, who's an expert in pulmonary fibrosis. And so I really think that when you're building your teams, selecting people that have the expertise that you need to finish the project that you might not have yourself is, is the key uh, to, to doing that. And then I think I want to just say that having a diverse team is really important to me. So I want to make sure that my teams include women and people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, people from different educational backgrounds. My lab is very interdisciplinary. Sometimes we have mechanical engineering students, materials engineering students, uh, biologists, chemists, medical fellows. And I believe that having all of those different areas of expertise on a team and all of those different experiences really leads to creativity and uh, helps you get your project done. Okay, I'm gonna um, ask Zuri, Zuri, sorry, Zuri's question. If you do not have money to hire a full-time or part-time CEO for a startup, who will deal with the business jobs? Good question. I, well, I guess you could potentially work out something with your tech transfer office where they would help you do some of the business negotiations at the very, very beginning. Um, but you would have to be highly involved as the faculty member spinning out the technology. So a few extra late nights. I think so. And I know some people that have gone back for those, uh, you know, to get an MBA after they did their PhD because they were really excited about the entrepreneurial aspects of things. And um, my friend who did that had a PhD in microbiology and he's like, Chelsea, this stuff is easy. You just you'd be fine. If you have a PhD, you can do it. And so I think really it's the formal training that we don't have, right? And um, I'm not saying that engineers and scientists and uh, you know physicians that are spinning out these technologies can't do the business end of the thing of these things. But I think you need a lot of training and experience to come across as an expert in those areas. So potentially try to find some other resources to help if it's an academic model. And one thing I know from my experience with um, CU Innovations over the years is that if you take a good idea to them, and you know, and, and, and we all think that our personal ideas are the best, right? Right. Because <laughs> mine are. I mean, I don't know about you, but mine are. And, and then they evaluate it and they put that business lens on your idea. And sometimes you don't get the answers you want. Sometimes they tell you that you don't have those pieces of information. Some of the simple things even that you talked about, Chelsea, and I think that's earlier, Chelsea, and I think that's true. So, so let's say that Jury, Jury sorry, um, goes to tech transfer and they say, well, you know, we really can't help you. Should you just throw it out the window or should, what should you do next? Gosh, that's a really tough question. It is So hard. tech transfer. If tech transfer doesn't take up your technology and patent it, you then as a faculty member, depending on your university contracts at our university, I believe this is true, have the option to file a patent yourself on the technology privately. This is a very expensive and time expensive endeavor. Um, it'll cost, I don't know. 25. Some, yeah, t 
tens of thousands of dollars and could take seven to 10 years. And you better have a really good patent attorney helping you out. But if you do that, and then you commercialize that product, the university won't be taking any royalties. So if you really, really believe in your idea, it's something you could work to try to commercialize on your own outside of the university. Um, if the university tells you, hey, I don't think this is ready, uh, I don't, you know, X, Y, Z thing, you can take their feedback to heart and go back and workshop your idea and, and mm -hmm. bring back something that's, you know, been changed a little bit or maybe a completely brand new idea. I think it's important, um, like I mentioned way back in the beginning, to talk to the stakeholders and the final users of your product and really understand what they need because that will help convince your tech transfer office that you are addressing an unmet need. Excellent. Now, I don't want to lose this. You started a little bit of a conversation around diversity and women, and I don't want to lose this because it's very, very passionate about this topic myself. So when you think about women and underrepresented minorities, we know it's really hard to get promoted in the first place and to check all the boxes for um, all those promotion criteria and tenure criteria and all that other stuff. But what if we're just a natural inventor? What if we are entrepreneurial at heart? How can women, and I haven't even talked about the industry side of women in industry. Um, I do know that in 2019, only 12% of patents had a female lead. Um, it's even lower for underrepresented minorities. This bothers me. <laughs> so Chelsea, what, what can women do and people from other uh, groups do to improve their chance for success uh, in, in this entrepreneurial space? This is a, a very good question and I think remains a little bit difficult to answer. I don't, I don't think I have the solution, but I, do, I can tell you things that have helped me. Um, First, I believe you need a variety of different mentors. And so if you're entrepreneurial and you are um, in academia, find mentors outside of your academic setting as well, in addition to your academic mentors. Um, so find people that have started their own companies, find people that are venture capitalists, find, find those people and, and ask them to mentor you because I think that's really important. So one of the amazing resources we have here in Colorado is the Colorado Bioscience Association. It's a trade organization for um, people who are interested in commercializing bioscience technologies. A lot of different industry members take part in this, and it's an amazing place to network. They hold boot camps that help teach you how to start your own company. Um, they will connect you with, you know, patent attorneys. It's just a wonderful, wonderful group. And I think a lot of um, different university towns have groups like that to get to uh, to work with. I believe that it's also important to find peer mentors, people who look like you and do what you do, because I think it's sometimes you just need someone to drink a glass of wine with and complain for a minute, um, but to know that they're experiencing the same thing you are and to feel validated and to be able to support each other and help everyone be successful. And so I, I think it's important to both find those mentors that are already successful and um, to build a network of your peers so that you can, you know, lift each other up in times of need. Now, I have talked to some women, um, and we know that when it comes to venture capital and leveraging funding for your idea outside of the grant world, um, particularly if you want to head toward industry as an academic entrepreneur, we know that there's a tremendous body of research that says that women get way less funding when they pitch their idea. So what would be your advice to um, get your pitch to be heard if you're female or from an underrepresented group? It's a frustrating question, right? Because some people would say, I hired a well-represented man to be my CEO and he gives my pitches. Uh, uh, but you don't always want to give up that control and you don't want to give up the face of your company if it's your company, right? And so I think that getting those mentors to coach you is really important so that you are coming across as an authority, an expert, and, and convincing these people that they should invest in you. I have to say that um, my mother-in-law recently published a book called Beyond Discovery that talks a lot about these different things. It's a really excellent guide for academics who are interested in entrepreneurship. Um, and she is really passionate about helping 
women and underrepresented groups to be more successful in filing patents, becoming an inventor, and uh, and translating their technologies. So there might be some more pearls of wisdom in there. I guess all I can say is that you got to keep trying and we're going to get there eventually. I agree. I think that's true. All right. So if, if someone came to you and said, Chelsea, I have an idea. I'm a faculty member at CU, but I have this really good idea. I really want to do something. What questions would you ask? ask me when I first approached you to say, hey, Chelsea, I have this great idea. What do you think? How, yeah. How should we prepare and what should we be doing before we meet with you if we want to get advice from you? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the first question I would ask you is the first question that CU Innovations asks me is how would you commercialize this product? So you have to think beyond, hey, this is a cool idea. I think it'll help patients all the way to is this a medical device? Is this a drug product? Is this um, a fee for service that you've created? Are you repurposing a drug? I you think you have to get all the way to there before you're ready to talk to the tech transfer office. Because um, at the end of the day, if they're filing your patent for you, they're spending the tens of thousands of dollars and they want to recuperate that money at some point. So they are really invested in trying to help you commercialize your technology and not having a clear pathway to know, this is where my technology fits into the market, this is how it would turn into a product, I think ends up being one of the first stumbling blocks for faculty that are trying to translate their work out into, indus- into industry. I think that's very true because that my, my brain doesn't go to, how am I gonna commercialize this? Instead, my goes, look at what I've done, it's really cool, right? Right, so how and I-, I tested it and it has this awesome result. Right. Yeah, exactly. So how do we, I mean, is there a tip sheet somewhere, you know, almost like where do we go to even figure these things out? I wonder. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, read my mother-in-law's book, talk to your (laughs) tech transfer office early and often um, and talk to your friends that are interested in this kind of stuff too. Right. Um, I think that that, that kind of stuff is really helpful. If somebody, like you said, if somebody wanted to have coffee with me and talk about commercializing their ideas, I would ask these questions and hopefully point them in the right direction. I know that the Center for Women's Health Research on our campus has also created a program to help um, translate research ideas into products. They've partnered with CU Innovations for that. So if you are doing women's health specific research, that's also an excellent research resource for you as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what is your mother-in-law's books, the name of her book again, and her name? Oh, it's Yes, it's called Beyond Discovery, and her name is Joan Herbers. Thank you. And I have to, you know, full disclosure, I've already read this book, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's really, really good. And I think it should be required reading for any person, student, faculty, staff, interested in entrepreneurial activities coming out of a university, because it it really explains it uh, in in simple language. And I think one of the things that I um, stumble across uh, more often than not, is that we almost seem at cross purposes with each other, um, each other being industry and academics, because our language um, doesn't resonate with each other. Um, you know, and I joke with my engineering students as a clinician, when I say stress and you say stress, we really mean two different things, right? So what is your um, take on how we should work on that language. What, what, what would you advise, Chelsea? Oh, I think that's an excellent point. And I think I have to say that working in industry made me be- a better science communicator. I stopped oh. using all of my jargon. I, I learned how to explain complex research to people who are just as smart as me, but or don't have my same expertise, right? And I think it's a challenge to do that without making people feel like you're being condescending. So I think that training and scientific communication would help all of us to be on the same page because if someone in industry said, well, are, are you prepared to run ISO 10993 and do biocompatibility? Someone in academia could be like, I'm sorry, could you explain biocompatibility to me, um, right? And then we yeah. would be able to talk to each other in a respectful way and, and explain it to each other. So I think science communication, number one, is really important. Um, but number two, I think something the University of Colorado does really well is we have these seminars um, that are put on by the SPARC program that 
help introduce that lingo to the academic world. And uh, so there are lots of different topics every, I think, month or so. And I think if you're interested in, in really commercializing a technology that you really should attend these seminars and start to learn the language that the, everyone else is speaking. So that I think if we both come from a place of trying that we'll end up being able to talk to each other. Yeah, and I, I think I'm doing one of those lectures this summer on discovery, um, early stage discovery, because that's something that um, they were interested in bringing together. And I agree with Chelsea, those are great places to go. And those are open to everyone, I do believe. Um, so that's you don't right. have to be a Spark Reach recipient to participate in those. Um, okay, any other, we just have a couple minutes left. Any other questions from our audience today? Um, any thoughts that you would like to share um, as we talk through these really tough um, issues that we all face in one, uh, from one perspective or another? Okay. And so finally, I am gonna ask you one last question. I hope there's some students on today. Um, we talked at the beginning um, a little bit about your, your path. So what would be your advice for students who are getting, let's say, a, a graduate degree today, and they're kind of maybe on the fence about, do I go to industry or do I stay in academia? This is a really hard question, and I think a lot of students struggle with it. I know I did. Um, my advice is sort of, I kind of give it on two different levels. One is you want, my advice is to find a job that aligns with your values, because if what you value aligns with what you do every day at work, it's going to feel like a pleasure to go to work every day. Um, and so those could be like very big picture values, right? Like I would like to help people. So you could do that in academia or in industry. Um, you could also kind of zoom in and think about what do people who have this job do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so for example, as a faculty member, this might surprise people to hear. Um, I don't do a lot of benchtop research. I spend a lot of my time writing grants, writing papers, trainings, training mentees. I spend a lot of time um, in meetings, planning projects. I spend a lot of time in meetings, uh, teaching folks new things that they haven't done before, like how to write their first manuscript or how to apply for their first grant application. Um, and so on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I am sitting on my butt in front of my computer and not in the lab pipetting. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, asking you, yourself those questions, would I enjoy um, writing grants? Would I enjoy leading a team? Would I enjoy managing people? It will help you kind of narrow in on what do you want to do? Because in industry, there's a wide range of op options, right? The, you could be the person on the bench running the assays. You could be the person designing the assays. You could be the person supervising the people designing the assays. Uh, you could work on the regulatory team and be um, you know, in charge of those quality documents that I did not want to work on. Uh, so there are lots of different spots for different people. Um, but one of, I think the best advice I have is once you make that decision about what you want to do, every time a, an opportunity comes up, which they do all the time, right? There's always an opportunity to uh, teach an extra class or uh, serve on a specific committee or do another project. Ask yourself, does completing this opportunity move me one step closer to my ultimate goal? And if the answer is no, you have to politely decline it. You can't do everything. And you really need to do the things that build your CV and build your experience to the point that you will achieve your ultimate goal. Awesome, thank you so much, Chelsea. Well, I think on that note, I am going to thank everyone for attending today. Um, it's been so nice, Chelsea, to have you and, and to learn a little bit about your world and, and how you think about things. It's deeply appreciated. And we will see you guys all again, uh, hopefully in June. So take care and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.